Good morning. How is everybody this morning? Yes. I can you can all I can count on Vince. How about the worship team? Don't think you could do a good job. Can you bless them this morning? I know uh, I've told this story before, but if you're new with us, remember we uh Church is, uh, we've been here about a year now, and we were first getting together as a, as a core group. We were, you know, we had concerns about things that were, were go, or weren't going to work out, and one of the things that we were praying about is, who's going to do worship? Are we going to be able to find anybody to do worship? And now we have, you know, God bless us with more worship people than we know what to do with, so it's definitely a blessing from God to have these guys come up here and share their hearts with us in song and lead us in song. It's, uh, I mean, it, there's a lot of pressure involved with learning new songs, and um, you know how we, us church people are. We like our music, and we like our songs, and um, we don't like other songs. So um, just, just you know, when you pray for us and pray for the church, make sure you, you keep those guys in your prayers as well because they, they have a hard job, and they do a really good job at what they do. <clears throat> okay, so we've been, the last three weeks we've been going through the book of Jude. These 25 little verses that are tucked away right before Revelation. I don't want to go all the way to Revelation because I'm not ready to start too much trouble yet. So we're going to, we're going to stay right here with Jude. And um, One of my things about when we just, I was trying to figure out what book we wanted to go through, and I've told this, this is the third week in a row I've told this, is Jude is not the one I would pick. Um, it's just not. I mean, there's a lot of tough stuff in the middle of Jude that, um, you know, we talked about how the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, and, you know, this is just one of those books that when you read it, it just cut, it kind of cuts you to the heart, but in a good way. But I've also gotten some new perspectives from it, studying to go through it, that you know that there are a lot of really good, positive, uplifting uh, things that can be mined out of Jude 2 when you get into it and study it. So, of course, we started off and we talked about who Jude was. Uh, he was uh, an earthly brother to Jesus. He was another one of Mary's sons. Um, of course, he, was, he wasn't an apostle. We talked about who he wrote it to. And why he wrote it. And any time we study scripture, that that those things are important to learn. It's also important to know that that the books and the letters in the Bible, the books in the Bible, weren't written to us, but they were written for us. So to go in and find out who they were written to helps give us some more insight on what what's going on at that time, and maybe how we should take it and apply it to our own lives. Uh, we talked about mercy and peace, um, and blessings, and and what it means. You know, to be to follow Christ and how, how what a calling that is on our lives. We talked about our calling just to be saved to begin with, and we talked about our specific calling that we get into as we grow and we're sanctified. Then week two is all the fun stuff, you know, the ever the darkness and judgment and fallen angels and apostasy and false teachers, uh, the real fun stuff, you know, uh, and and how how we go about and, and as we come closer to Jesus coming back. Um, how we, uh, what do I want to say here? But as we come closer, closer to the end, like how do we spot that sort of falseness, the false teaching, the apostasy? How do we guard against that stuff? Um, so with all this stuff going on, as we, as we come closer to the end, the scriptures talk about great falling away. They talk about how there'll be great persecution and there'll be, Lots of things that it just looks like it would be hard to follow through on. And I believe the last five verses of Jude, and really all of Jude, which is essentially about truth and recognizing the truth, um, but it's also a call to persevere. Uh, perseverance. Now, that's, that's a subject. Every great movie has got some story about perseverance in it. Every great story. Like I think of Rudy. When I think of perseverance, I think about Rudy. Don't, who, who doesn't think about Rudy when they think about perseverance? Maybe it's because I'm a football guy. But he was kind of against all odds. It didn't look like he was going to make it. But he never gave up hope, which is very important. But Rudy persevered. Uh, the scriptures talk about, you know, the, a lot of times when you read the New Testament, it tells you to go back and look at some of the Old Testament stories. Uh, the perseverance of Job. Like, who hasn't gone to Job or been told to go to Job when you're going through something or going through a struggle? Um, the perseverance, when you think about the apostles and the way that some of them met their ends, the way some of our missionaries, what they're going through in other countries, 
and how they're having to persevere. And that God has called me, He's called all of us that have come to faith. You know, He's He's given us, we talk about how when God gives to us, we want to give back of what He's given to us. But God gave us our life. And I think about it all the time when I start to think about that sort of thing. When I start to think about, you know, Paul, when he wrote, when he coined one of the greatest verses that probably the most quoted script uh, verse that there is, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, you know, I'm like, we had all this snow and I have a really steep hill. And I've been, you know, I, if I'm not careful, I can catch myself thinking, well, persevering is me having to walk up my hill in the snow two days this week. Um, but, you know, and I'm thinking, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and I need to exercise more as I'm walking up there. I did not walk up backwards and barefoot. I wasn't ready for that yet. You know, I don't, I don't think I'm old school enough to walk up backwards and barefoot in the snow. So I had shoes on and I went forwards. But, you know, and I do believe that God it cares about and wants to be involved in the small things in our life. I believe he cares about every aspect of everything we do. But I also, I look at that kind of faith. Faith where I would stand up in persecution and be tortured, killed, and to give up my life. And I think, just being brutally honest with myself, am I, have I grown to that? Could I, if I was faced with that, what would I do? Would I deny and run away like Peter did? Or would I stand up like John, who was dipped in hot wax and set on fire, and what he did while he was on fire was preach, and he didn't burn up. And then Nero got so scared, he, he banished him to an island somewhere, Patmos, where he wrote Revelation. You know, do I have that sort of perseverance you know, I think about, when you think about that kind of stuff and persecution and things like that too, you think about physical danger and you think about maybe mental danger. You think about, man, I'm just, I'm fortunate, I'm glad I don't live in that sort of an environment. But when we think about what we have here in our culture, where there's so much stuff and there's so much convenience, I believe that we're in, in as much spiritual danger, if not more, than anywhere in the world. Right? When you... When people are put under persecution, the church grows like wildfire. You know, people, I mean, it just spreads like it always has. When it was persecuted under Rome, it exploded. In China, it exploded. But now we get to where we can get to a place where we think, well, I really am not depending on God for anything. I'm depending on my job. I'm depending on my resources. I'm depending on the government. I'm depending on all these things. I really don't, I can find my, myself thinking, which is not true, that I don't need God. So and when you get into that climate, when you get into that place in your faith, there's really a call to, you know, as, as Paul also coined, to fight the good fight, to win the race, to finish the race, to keep the faith. You know, how can we go about doing that? And I think um, he talks about that, you know, in the midst of all this, these bad ideas, in the midst of all of this, this stuff that's going on, he gets into that. Now I'm going to start in verse 20. Um, but you, beloved... Build yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit to keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. I want to stop there. I think there's two, when you read these two verses, I think there's two things we want to look at. Now this is kind of how do we, we go about, what are the essentials to, to persevering? How can we build ourselves up? Uh, verse 20, it says, uh, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, something I can do, right? Building myself up, that's something I can do. Uh, praying in the Holy Spirit, praying, is something I have to decide to do, isn't it? Right? I mean, I have to decide, I have to make a commitment, I have to make the decision to pray. Keep yourself in the love of God. Again, it seems like the scripture here is calling me, right, to, this is something I do. This is my part of what I'm supposed to do. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now, I want to jump down to verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. That is what who is going to do. What he's going to do. To him who is, who is able. God is able. Can everybody say God is able? God is able. He's able to keep me from stumbling and to present me faultless. Right, That's what we have. That's when we're covered by the blood of Jesus. We're presented faultless when we come into Jesus. Or we come into judgment. Before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior who alone is wise. 
be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. So it's like my part of the deal, God's part of the deal. And I can promise you he's going to keep up his side of the deal. Right? God is able. He will present you, prevent you from stumbling. Everything that God says he's going to do, he's going to do. But sometimes he's waiting on us to do our part, right? Sometimes. Sometimes he just takes over and it's going to happen whether you want it to or not. But if God says it's going to come to pass, it's going to come to pass. So I've, I could go so many different ways with this. As a matter of fact, I have two outlines up here with me right now. But, but the three things that have stuck out to me, um, three things that we need to be able to persevere in the faith. Uh, you can say them with me if you want to. But we need endurance. We need perspective. And we need hope. We need endurance, perspective, and we need hope. Um, endurance. You know, anybody that's ever, how many people have played a sport in here? Right? You guys back here. You know all the fun conditioning and all the kind of stuff you do for, you guys play a lot of sports. So, you, yeah, you run and you're track. So, like, conditioning is your sport. I don't know how you do it, man. I Bless you. Bless you. I don't know how you do it. But, you know, we have to build up. We're called to build, build up endurance. We have to get ourselves physically fit as athletes. Um, if you're on the academic team, if you're preparing to go into a job, right, you, you have to get yourself mentally fit. You have to start to do today. There are things that you can do to get yourself ready to do things tomorrow that you can't do right now. You know? I mean, when you guys first jumped in the weight room, you didn't squat 500 pounds. May not be yet. You will, or else. No, just kidding. You will. But you know what I mean. You have to. You have to put on what you can do, and you work yourself up, and you build. You build that up. You get yourself able to endure the rigors of a football, baseball, basketball season, or whatever it is. So there, there's part of that thing. Now, when it comes to the faith, you know, how do we go about that? We pray. We keep ourselves in the love of God. We do the the sort of Things that we, you know, we all know that we're supposed to do. But they're really important because right now, the way it is, you know, we don't see that we may have to endure some sort of hardship like we read about in church history or that we read about that's happening in other countries. But it could happen overnight. And am I in shape enough? Am I, phys- am I spiritually fit enough to endure persecution? Am I, am I physically fit enough to be able to handle something like that? Um, I want to read from you, and a part of being able to endure, I think a lot of that relies on wisdom. And I want to, I'm going to read to you in a minute from Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. This is still, on, this is still part of what we can do. <clears throat> you know, having the wisdom to not put on myself any more burden that's already going to come from trying to walk the faith in our life. I mean, when you, you look at what, kind of what the Christian life looks like, and we, as we strive to walk like Jesus walked, to love people like he loved, to do ministry, to be disciplined and have self-control like he had, um, and then, you know, the pushback we get, all, of, all the comforts and all these things that get thrown at us through our media, through everything that we talked about a couple, couple of weeks ago, we already have a large burden that God is definitely helping us bear, but it, it's so easy for us to put more burdens on us than we need to care to carry. Uh, it's really easy. You know, that's what, why Jesus was talking about. Um, don't, why are you worrying about tomorrow? Today has enough trouble of its own. And how easy is it? Even, even doing church stuff. There's an author and apologist I'm really, really fond of. His name is Ravi Zacharias, and I've talked about him a couple of times this week. And he, I mean, he's got one of the, what I would think would be one of the toughest jobs to do in faith. He goes to universities and he shares the gospel uh, through apologetics. You know, he does apologetics and shares the gospel with skeptics, atheists, and very, very highly educated people. And he's, he does an amazing job at it. And that's what he felt called to do. Well, you know, his church asked him to become a professor to teach this sort of skill. And it, it seemed like a noble, it seemed like a very church-worthy thing to do. And he said, but I got, I got so involved with church work that I knew wasn't central to my calling. I wasn't in the center of the will of God, and I was miserable. I was absolutely miserable. I was doing good things, 
but I knew that I wasn't in the center of the will of God. That he had put on, on himself an extra burden, when, you know, when his, instead of his yes being, or his no being no, when he should have prayed on that. And, uh, and I don't, I'm kind of fumbling this a little bit, but do you get what I'm saying? Like sometimes we can even do noble things and we take more on ourselves than we were meant to to begin with. The same can be true, you know, with definitely with, you know, sin and non-church, non-faith-based stuff that we can take on so many things that we, we're taking an extra burden on ourselves and we already have enough uh, to bear. But Proverbs 2, 1 through 9 will help us out with this. I'll read it to you. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands with, within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your, and apply your heart to understanding. If you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Now that's what, here again we have what we can do, and then this is what God will do in return. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So if I'm trying to figure out what burdens do I need to take up and which ones I don't, he's giving us direction right here. Right? If you receive my words, treasure my commands, incline your ear to wisdom, apply your heart to understanding, cry out for discernment, lift up your voice for understanding, and if you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures. How many people work as hard, and I'm not one of them, I'll confess to you, work as hard at getting wisdom from God as you do to make sure you're putting food on the table and putting money in the bank. If, if I search for that, he's telling me, if I search for it that hard, then I'll understand. Then I will understand the fear of the Lord, find the knowledge of God. He will give me the wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up wisdom for the upright. He's a shield to those who walk uprightly, and he guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity, and every good path. So those are just a few things as we dig into Scripture and dig into prayer. Um, dig into, you know, praying and praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, I do not have time to open that can of worms for you this morning. <laughs> if you would like to talk to me and, and find out what I believe or even what it, that's even talking about, I'd be more than happy to sit down with you today or any time, and we, we can talk about that. We'll probably come up at some point, again, later in a sermon or a teaching. But, um, you know, the, here's the thing, though. I would suggest that first start with Proverbs 2 and ask God that question. Hey, what is praying in the Holy Spirit? And then seek after it like you would seek after silver, after you would seek after gold. Uh, endurance. Okay, so number two, we have endurance, and then we have, do anybody remember what the next one was? Perspective. Perspective. I was talking about my first world problem of having to walk up the hill two times all year in the snow. Have anybody seen those memes and the, the YouTube videos and just the different pa- Facebook posts about first world problems? Anybody got an example? What's a, what's, what, what's a first world problem? Can anybody define that for me? Like, is my pizza going to get here in 30 minutes? God, why have you forsaken me? It's been 45. Right? First, first world problems. <clears throat> you know, our perspective versus God's perspective. You know, and, and, and on a more serious note, we go through tougher things than our first world problems, right? I mean, we have... We lose people. Um, we face persecution in, in some in different kinds of ways: mental, you know, social sort of persecution, which is not, it's not easy. It's not the same as what's going on in other places. It, when we suffer, when we lose a loved one, when something like that goes on, it's very easy to lose perspective on what God might be doing, what what the big picture is. It's easy to forget that my hill, which is a big climb for me, is nothing for God. And, you know, and when we get into Scripture and we look at stories like Job, when we look at Noah, and we, and we look at just all the different things, how they probably didn't understand what was going on at first and they didn't see the whole picture. But we are fortunate enough now to be able to look back and see how those stories played out. We can, we ha- can have and should seek God's perspective on the things that we're going through. You know, how many, I mean, it, when you go through something, tragic and tough in your life, you're going to move closer or further from God. You're going to move. You're, you're going to move one way or the other. When I'm comfortable, when 
I don't move. Or actually, I'm, I'm just drifting. God is moving and I'm not. So there's some separation going on there. Most of the time, unfortunately, we have to have something like that to really help us take a, a step forward. You know, everything that I've ever done or accomplished in my life that's worthwhile and that I remember and that I'd want to share, I had to go through some pain to get where I wanted to be. I had to endure. I had to actually go through stuff. I mean, one of the things that's moved me closer to God more than anything in my life was losing my two, my, both of my grandparents. You know, someone, a senseless crime, murdered them both in the same day. And, you know, people was like, you know, how could, you know, people would ask, how does God let that kind of thing happen? Why? It's like, I, that time, oddly enough, is the most peaceful, the most fruitful time that I've ever had as far as moving forward in my faith with God. Because I knew what kind of people they were. I saw God's perspective through them like we can see through each other. And we can see it in Scripture, and we can see it played out in the lives of other people around us. So, you know, when we're going through things like that, that, you know, God has got an end. He sees the whole picture. He's, he's at the end waiting for us to get there. So it's really, really important for us to pray, to see things uh, from, from a different perspective, from his perspective. Right? Like some of you right now are looking at my good side, and the other one's my bad side. Some are saying, man, he's handsome. Some of you are saying, hey, man, he's ugly. It's all about perspective. I'm still the same guy, Right? You don't have to think I'm handsome. I got one person that thinks I'm handsome, so I'm okay with that. Um, you know, and I think one thing that really will really zap us and zap our joy and make it hard to persevere is when we get disappointed with God. And I've, I've never really thought about this before until I was thinking about this. Um, and, I, and if everybody in here was honest, you, there's, a, there's been a time that you've been disappointed with God and you didn't want to tell him about it. There's been a time, and this is going to sound weird, but let me explain myself, where you needed to forgive God and you didn't. Now, I don't say that because God needs your forgiveness or else he doesn't get to go to your heaven. That's, that's not what I'm saying. But you've been to a place where you thought something should work out. You'd been praying about it. You'd been studying. You know you did things the right way and it didn't work out the way you thought. You know, you were praying for that person that get better that didn't. You were praying for the, ch- the child to, to go and, and be able to have success in this thing or to not to stumble into this thing, and it didn't happen. And, but you had been faithful, and you had prayed, and it didn't work out the way you thought. And maybe you didn't realize it, but you got mad at God, and you never talked to him about it, and you never forgave him. You need to forgive God. He doesn't need you to forgive him. He wants you to. He knows how important it is. Has anybody ever been in that place? I have. I've been, in, I've been there more than once or twice where I needed to say, it's okay to say that to God. He knows you're thinking it. He knows you're feeling it. Let him have it. You know, take it all to him. Now, there's a place, you know, where you, where you get scared. You don't want to, you don't curse God. You don't insult him and that, that sort of thing. But, you know, if you read through Job, Job had some really pressing questions. He really had a problem with what was going on, and he wasn't afraid to tell him about it. And through the whole thing, God says that he didn't sin in that. So you can really take, take comfort in that. The one thing I think about uh, as far as, you know, our forgiveness is vertical to each other or to God and then it's horizontal between each other. Think about Noah for a minute. You know, Noah was told and, and he, believed, he trusted God and believed in that he was supposed to build a boat. And God gave him all of these. I mean, it's crazy if you read through there. All the dimensions of what kind of wood to make it out. How high? How, how long? It had to be covered. He told him exactly how many animals. What did it take? Does anybody remember? I didn't actually have, didn't go back and read through the story. Is it 140 years it took? Is that about right? 140 years of hard work. But, and I'm sure he didn't have cranes and the sort of things that we had. But he, you know, to build this boat exactly how God wanted it. And he did it. He went through all that. He did all that work. He did all that stuff. He, you know, he had to have people help him. And then he gets on the boat. And guess what? It doesn't have a sail or a rudder. All of a sudden, I'm supposed to be I'm doing all this stuff, and I get in here, and I'm just getting blown around by the sea. I have absolutely no control over what's going on. None. And this is the part where, that was the part where what, what Noah was supposed to do met with what God promised he was going to do. And he had to just fully trust. How many times have we... We've done what we're supposed to do, and we get to that point, and we still want to hold on to control of the thing, and we just get tired. We get tired of ministering. 
We get tired of doing the stuff. We get tired of praying. We get tired of asking for forgiveness because we've held on to control for so long that we won't just let it go when we need to let it go. And I don't believe letting God take control means that you just lay around and wait for him to magically use the magic dust again and to burst me into activity. But what I mean is just through discernment, learning when we, it's time to let this go to God. That I've, I've done, I've kept the faith, I've done what he's asked me to do. Now trust him, I guarantee you he'll come through on his part. So we have endurance, we have perspective, and what's the last one? Hope. I'm, I'm going to keep going back to sports because it's, I guess it's one of the things I know. But, you know, when we're, we're, we're playing, a, you know, football is my sport. When, when we have a lead at halftime, you know, however much, three, four touchdowns, the other team's getting the ball, what do we want to do? We want to stop them and we want to score and we want to take away their what? Hope. We want to take the hope away because we know if we can get your hope, we know that if you believe there's no way that you can get out of this, there's no way that you can win, you're going to lay down. It might not actually be gone, but if we can make you believe you don't have a chance, we, same, same way the other way. If we're down, it's like, guys, I'm letting you in on a secret here. <laughs> we're, 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 we're trying to figure out what plays we can run, but we're like, how do we give them hope? What do we got to do? What do we have to do to make them believe? Because it's true, they can do it, but how do we reinstill hope in them? Your faith completely depends on your hope, right? If there's no hope that at the end of this life, when I've, when I've struggled, when I've gone through all this stuff with God, that there's nothing after, what, what, what would we do? Would we do anything if there's no hope? It's like, well, I'm going to do all this stuff for God, but I know in the end he's just going to cast me out. We, we quit. When our hope is gone, our faith is gone because we quit. They're dependent on each other. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hope is what calls us to faith. And we had a conversation with some people not too long ago. I think it was a Saturday morning conversation about belief and hope. Or I'm sorry, belief and faith. Um, and going from belief that something happens to belief in something happens. And I think about it this way. Belief is the fact that, hey, you know, I believe there's a God. I believe he sent Jesus. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in miracles. I believe in what the scriptures have to say. Faith is what moves me. Faith is the part of action. Like this stool right here, I believe, I believe that if I sit down right here, I'm not going to flip the Anna over, right? And this thing is going to hold me, right? I believe it. And I can sit here and talk to you all day about believing it. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. But until I do this, and I put all my weight on the seat and trust that it's going to hold me up, I'm, it's not faith yet. It's not faith. I believe that it will, but I don't believe in its ability to hold me up. There's a, and I've probably shared this story before because I love it, but another apologist that I, I really like to listen to and pastor, uh, J. Warner Wallace, his career was built on, co, he was a cold case detective, and he wrote the book Cold Case Christianity. And he used to be in the crime and gang unit, and we dealt with, you know, gang crime and drugs and that sort of thing. And he talked about his bulletproof vest. He said, I knew the science behind the bulletproof vest. They told me it would protect me. They told me it was good to wear it. And I believed him. I believed that it would. You know, and I wore it when I, I went. So that's the faith part, right? So I had faith that it would, could possibly help me. But it wasn't until somebody, I pulled somebody over and they unloaded a couple of rounds into it. And I lived that I believed in it. So if we are going to go from belief in to belief that, faith is the journey in between. You know, I believe that God will do everything he said in here. Hopefully I've got the faith and I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing about it. And as these things come to pass, and as God continually proves himself to be faithful to what he said he was going to do, I believe, believe in Jesus. I believe in what he did for me. I believe in the sacrifice that he made. So we have endurance, we have perspective, and if we, we have hope. Um, you know, faith, hope, and love. What do we got if we don't have love? 
know the great love verse, and I'll bring it up a million more times. I repeat things so they become yours. Uh, sometimes I'm just, I guess I'm getting closer to 40, and I just forget that I already said it. But most of the time, <laughs> I try to do it on purpose. But if we don't have love for God, we don't have love for one another, that's none of, nothing we're doing. Paul said it even trumps faith in 1 Corinthians 13. Very end, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. It trumps even faith. It trumps even the hope that keeps us going. If I got, don't have that, I don't have anything. And I know, I know for a fact, I don't know everything about what everybody else in our church leadership group thinks about every little uh, facet of the faith. I know this, that they love people, and that's why we're here. Because we love our community, because we love people enough, we know how important this message is, and we want that to be out, out of the love that God has for us, because we can't love you if he doesn't love us first, but that's it. If we don't have that, there is, I mean, none of, none of this works. You know, it is the constant to the equation is love. So I hope that you've experienced that this, this love that God has for you. Not just, I hope you experience it. We want you to grow close to God, and we want you to feel loved by him and loved by us. If we're not doing that, if you're not feeling that, and you've come to visit here and you don't feel that, find somewhere else. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you. If, you. if you're not getting the love of God here and you don't feel like you can grow closer to God here, we don't want that to happen to the point that we would say, we will help you find somewhere that you can feel that way and that you can get nurtured that way. I'm not saying I don't want you. I'm saying if you're not getting that, you don't need to be here. And I feel that strongly about that, and I know that everybody else in our leadership group feels that way too. If you're not growing closer to God, then we, we, we're not helping you. If, and don't, again, for me, I can say, I'll solve, I'm just going to put myself out there for this one. If you don't feel that and you want to know, you want, you want to feel it here, come talk to me about what's going on and why you don't. You know, I mean, there's, you have a different perspective than I have of what goes on here. Everybody, each one of us in here, we're seeing the same church, we're seeing the same God, we're seeing the same Jesus, but you have a different perspective. And there may be something that slipped our attention because we don't have your, your perspective. Do not, please don't be afraid to come and share that with us. But folks, there's a, there's a time coming. All through the Old Testament, you know, God promised a Messiah. He promised that he would send a messenger. He promised that he would send his son. And that he would come and for our sins would die. He would be buried. He would be resurrected. He would ascend into heaven. And he would return. All of them but one's happened. All of them but one. And that, and that one, I don't know how close it is. It's closer than it was 2,000 years ago. That's the one thing I know for sure that I can tell you. You know, there, you know we see signs. You know, people then believed it was soon. When we think about God's time and God being able to see the big picture, it is soon. Compared to eternity, what's 2,000 years? You know, Forever. You know, heaven is a place I want to be forever. Forever. And, you know, he's coming back. Everything that God has said he was going to do, he has done but that. I could, there's a, is it possible I'm wrong? Well, yeah, I guess. But everything else checks out. And it's not just, it's verifiable through science, believe it or not. History, archaeology, I mean, constantly, it, the Bible checks out. The stuff that we can know checks out. All of it. The easiest thing to prove and, you know, without, without using the scriptures about Jesus is the fact that he was resurrected. That's the thing we have the most evidence of. Isn't that unbelievable? Or we have plenty of evidence that he lived, that he was crucified, that he was resurrected. If I believe that God can bring somebody back from the dead, which I have what else would I have a problem with believing? It's pretty incredible. He's defeated death for us. He's defeated death for me. He's defeated it from you. And if you want him to be able to present you faultless, then we've we got to turn away from what the world wants us to do and turn to his way. If you haven't done that, now's the time. Right? If you were a place where you believed, the weeds of the world came and choked it away, come let us pray for you. Come, come talk to us about it. That God loves you. 
He sent his son to come for you. He came to rescue you. You must grab a hold of that. While we still can. While we still can. Vince is going to lead us, or the, I guess the band's going to come up and lead us in a song. And while he's pl- playing, I'm going, to, I'm going to pray and then we're going to play the song. But while they're singing, if you need to talk to myself, Rick, or Kevin, um, I don't know if you, Rick, you mind standing up? You know, find one of us. I don't know if you know, if you, you probably, most of you probably already know us, but if you don't, here we are. You know, come and grab one of us and we'll talk to you, we'll pray for you, whatever you need. We'll put whatever we got on hold. I'll sit here with you until I'm late for work if I need to. All right? Come. Come today if you need to. Dear Lord, I want to thank you for the book of Jude. I want to thank you for your promises. I want to thank you that you are able to present us faultless, that you're able to hold us up with your Holy Spirit and to keep us from stumbling. And Lord, I'm sorry for the times that I haven't taken care of my part of the bargain, uh, that I haven't gotten in shape to be able to protect myself from everything that the world's going to throw at me. Uh, Lord, I just I pray for those who are, who are going through physical turmoil for your sake, and, not, and, and, and just physical turmoil, period, mental anguish, uh, and spiritual trouble, Lord, spiritual sickness. Lord, I pray for, for all of those, and that you would help us and show us uh, your your. Just give us a passion, God, for to, to seek after your wisdom, to seek after your knowledge, and to, to see things through your eyes, to love with your heart, to serve with your hands, to think with your mind, not so that we can act like we are you, but so that we can be more like you so the world can see and they can come to know you for salvation. We thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for getting us here safe, and we thank you for watching over us as we go home. I pray for all of those who have turned their back on you, that knew the way of the truth and have turned away. Lord, I just ask that you would call them back this morning. I want to pray for everybody in our box. Uh, all the names in there are, are very precious to you, we know, and they're very precious to us. So thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Stand and join us as we worship. God is able, He will never fail, He is almighty God, greater than all we see, greater than all we ask, He has done great things, lifted up, He defeated the grave, raised to life, our God is able, in His name we overcome. God is with us, God is on our side.